today we're going to talk about biology, how uh, quantum is applied to biology. Okay, so weird. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Okay, let me know. Also, I've had all kinds of technical problems lately, I'm trying to solve them. They distract from the uh, from the lecture, but uh, yeah, we do what we can here. <laughs> um, Okay, anyways, we're going to be talking about Mr. Al-Khalili, Jim Al-Khalili. He's supposedly a mathematical physicist. Uh, the physicist part doesn't belong there. He's just a mathematician. That's all he does. And then he gives irrational interpretations to, um, to his math. And that's what all mathematicians do. Okay, and that's what they teach. They pass that on from one generation to another. Okay, and uh, what does uh, or what um, what does Mr. Al Khalidi try to do? Well, he tries to uh, apply quantum mechanics to biology. Okay, and uh, that's uh, more or less uh, dealing with biology at the uh, atomic, really at the subatomic level. That's what they're trying to do here. That's what this. Uh, exciting emerging field known as quantum biology is going to try to do. They're going to try to see what happens not at the uh, molecular or even at the cell level. Now they're going to go deeper. They're going to go into the atom and try to explain all those processes with quantum mechanics, with whatever they learned or they understand in the realm of quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, And that's a little scary. And so uh, I consider that he's a caricature of science because of that, because he's going to apply something which they don't understand to try to understand biology. In other words, the processes of biology. Uh, so if there ever was um, such a, uh, a world where you have this, this mixture of uh, quantum with biology, I think it does get scary. Okay. Okay. Um, why is uh, Alkalili a character of science? Well, because uh, he essentially is going to say, he, this is gonna, how he's going to start his presentation. He's going to say that a particle can be at two places at once. That's what they learn or understand in quantum mechanics. And he's going to apply that same type of thinking to, uh, to biology. Okay, so here's his statement, if I can get this thing up there. Okay, and he says the following, he says, does life itself rely on quantum mechanics? That's already making me nervous. <laughs> he said, it's one of the biggest mysteries in science. Okay, what, and he continues, he says, uh, what, distinguishes, what distinguishes living matter from inanimate matter or equivalent complexity? Okay, and uh, that's what he's gonna try to answer especially with uh, quantum biology, he says, but maybe there's hope, you know, because maybe we're starting to see hints of an answer. What is he referring to? Well, that he's going to introduce quantum into biology. And they're going to fix all the problems, just like they fixed them all in physics. He's going to fix them all in biology. Okay. And why? Because when we enter the world of atoms, we end up with a fuzzy world where particles can be at two places at once. <laughs> So uh, get ready. That's what uh, the future of biology is going to be like. You know, they're, they're going to be introducing all this quantum nonsense in there, and they're going to try to explain uh, biological processes using quantum mechanics. Okay? And, yeah, that is scary, especially if uh, it has to do with doctors, with viruses, and with a lot of what's going on today. It is a little scary because they're going to give you a lot of irrational interpretations. Okay? Okay. So, um, uh, how does uh, Alkali start his presentations? And, and he does this everywhere he goes. So, he gets paid to do his talks. And he essentially, he says the same thing in all of them. He says, quantum mechanics is hugely successful. That's your sales pitch, okay? That's how he starts. I mean, are you going to question that? You're going to say, no, no, it's not hugely successful. No, no, you got to accept it. And why? Because uh, he says the most powerful, the most successful theory in all of science. Now, that is a little bit perplexing. We've been talking in the last couple, couple sessions 
that they don't seem to know what they're doing in quantum mechanics. They don't seem to understand the processes. He says it's the most successful of all the sciences. Okay, it describes the building blocks of reality of our universe. Describes if they're going to describe. It's not a theory. A theory is an explanation. Keep that in the back of your mind. Quantum mechanics provides us with the laws and the rules that tell us how the subatomic world behaves, how atoms fit together to make molecules, and how the particles come together to make atoms. Is that what quantum does? I thought they said they didn't understand it, but now he claims that they do and that that's what quantum does. Does he understand any of those three processes that he just described? And, uh, and then uh, he, he goes in there, you know, and he uh, continues. And he says the following, he says, the properties of these particles, how they behave, how they interact with each other is all described by this theory. Again, if a description, it's not a theory. Period. We're done. Theory is an explanation. If, if, if quantum describes, it's not a theory. We're interested in the, in the explanation part of quantum mechanics. That's the one we're interested in. The one they call philosophy or dismiss as philosophy, that's the one that's the real theory. A description is not a theory. Okay. And without which most modern technology that we rely on and take for granted today simply wouldn't exist. Um, we certainly wouldn't have laptops, we wouldn't have mobile phones, we wouldn't have CD players and so on because of all those ideas. The whole of modern electronics relies ultimately on chips, which rely on semiconductors. Now, is that true? Uh, we get this sales pitch every day you know wherever you go you hear that uh, uh, the theories would not be correct if the technology wouldn't work but since the technology works obviously the theories are correct that's the reason that's what you get thrown in your face when you go to some site to argue you know against quantum or relativity and one of the first things, or someone will mention there that, you know, if relativity were wrong, GPS wouldn't work. And if quantum were wrong, you wouldn't have that computer you're typing on. That's the type of argument these people make. And that, there you have uh, Al Khalidi, a trained mathematical physicist, telling you the same thing. Is this true? Well, let's find out. First of all, we uh, invoke uh, what... Um, Al Khalidi mentioned about Richard Feynman the other day, okay? And that's this. This is what Feynman said. One of the things that I mentioned, he mentioned several things. I'm just going to mention this one. One might still look, uh, this is what uh, Feynman said in one of his uh, lectures, okay? One might still look, uh, like to ask, how does it work? What is the machinery behind the law? No one has found any machinery behind the law. No one can explain any more than we have just explained. No one will give you any deeper representation of the situation. We have no ideas about a more basic mechanism from which these results can be deduced. In other words, they don't know. <laughs> In simple language, uh, Feynman was saying that they don't know, and we have the same word from al -Khalili. Now, al -Khalili, you know, uh, did a superposition on that, okay? And he said when he was Adam Mann the other day, right? And he went on there and he filled in uh, the blanks a little bit. And he said, so what does QED, uh, quantum electrodynamics, right, right, actually say? It may be wonderful scientific description of nature, but trying to understand what Richard Feynman was doing with his theory is almost impossible, okay? This is what he himself said when he introduced his theory to the public. That's uh, Al Khalidi talking about Feynman. It is my task to convince you not to turn away because you don't understand it. You see, my physics students don't understand it. That's because I don't understand it. Nobody does. If the inventor of the theory doesn't understand, what possible hope is there for the rest of us? Okay, so uh, the question is, you know, how can this be such a successful theory if nobody understands the theory? What are we talking about? We're, there, there's a failure somewhere, okay? They can't, on the one hand, say, we wouldn't have all this technology if it weren't for quantum. Then you ask them, what about quantum? And they say, oh, yeah, we don't understand it. <laughs> uh, then how can, how can they later on say that we have the technology thanks to quantum, but they don't understand it?
somewhere we have a problem. And the problem is there that slight uh, shifting between description and explanation. Quantum is a description of the invisible world. They don't understand what's going on in there, but they can describe it if you assume that um, what's mediating it are discrete particles. And of course, when you do it with discrete particles, you don't understand it because you cannot explain any of those phenomena with discrete particles. And so that's where you close the loop. That's what's going on here. That's why they say, look, we've got the technology, but we don't understand the theory that stands, that underlies or stands behind the technology. Why? Because, uh, why? because if it's so accurate, if, if it's been proven to exhaustion, what are they talking about? They're talking about the mathematical description, not about the physical interpretation, which is bunk, which is nonsense, because you cannot explain what they're talking about with particles. That's it. That's that's where the problem is. That's where the catch is. OK, so if you understood that, well, you got some, you know, um, weapons to go into websites and clarify that for those folks. OK, OK, uh, so we go in there into the Wikipedia to find out what is quantum mechanics? I mean, how can they uh, say on the one hand that uh, it underlies technology? On the other hand, they say they don't understand it. What's going on here? OK. And this is what the Wikipedia says as far as quantum mechanics, the, the definition or what quantum mechanics is about. It says, is a fundamental theory in physics that describes. Again, you see there? There's the problem. No, a theory is an explanation. If quantum just describes, it's not an explanation. It's not a theory. In other words, that part of quantum is not the, uh, is not the theory. The theory is the explanation when they try to give a physical interpretation to a mechanism, an invisible mechanism. That's where they run into trouble. That's what's bunk. That's what's nonsense because they do it with particles. That's why it's nonsense. Anyone after 10,000 years, if someone didn't understand it, you can't continue doing, simulating the invisible world of Mother Nature's with particles. If you haven't understood that by now, well, you've got a mental problem or you've been brainwashed to exhaustion. You, you have to drop the particle hypothesis. There are no such things as discrete particles. You cannot explain the universe with discrete particles. That's where the problem is. It says, in physics, that describes the physical properties of nature at small scales. Okay, uh, I'm going to put a uh, contrary definition to that. This is what I think quantum is. That's, here's my definition in, so that you can compare notes there. Okay, See if you agree with that. And it goes like this, uh, quantum mechanics, mathematical descriptions of invisible subatomic phenomena, assuming they are mediated by discrete particles. <clears throat> a description is not a theory, a description is an explanation. Quantum only offers irrational mechanisms for invisible phenomena, leading quantum theorists openly uh, confess and concede that they do not understand the mechanisms that underlie their theories. Okay, so they don't have an explanation. They have a description. They call that description quantum mechanics. It's a mathematical description. That's what they say underlies technology, the fact that they can describe what's going on in there. But even that, I say, fails. Okay, I'm going to argue that that fails as well. In other words, quantum mechanics has absolutely nothing to do with technology. Okay, and I'm not only talking about here the... Uh, the uh, explanation, the physical interpretation of uh, mechanisms. I'm talking also about the description, the mathematical description, whether that has anything to do with technology and whether technology proves the uh, mathematical description. Because if we're going to assume that all this technology is mediated by particles, by discrete particles, well, maybe the math is wrong as well, because maybe they're applying the math to the wrong mediator. They're applying it to particles. Uh, standard model, all particles, right? And they cheat because they go from wave to particle, particle to wave, whenever they feel like it. And so it becomes a big mess after a while because you don't know what they're talking about. You know, they have to go back and forth uh, along this duality <laughs> to cover all the bases. Okay, uh, so one of the things we do to get uh, a rational 
discussion started, right, is we have to define what is science and what is technology so that we don't confuse them, okay? Here's a definition and a little drawing there to uh, highlight it, okay? Science, rational explanations. You just explain, for example, how two magnets work or how they attract each other or repel each other. Technology, de developing inventions through trial and error. That's what it is. Does the technologist have an explanation for why something happens? How it happened in others, meaning why, the cause, right? The mechanism? Not necessarily. For some things we do, the visible stuff, it's the invisible stuff that these people cannot explain. Okay? So that's where we run into trouble because people are confusing explanations with descriptions and technology with science. Technology you develop in the lab. You don't have to understand what you did. In other words, you don't have to understand the invisible part of what you did in order to, uh, to get a technology to, to invent something. Okay? You don't have to understand the invisible part of, of whatever you invented. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. Okay? And that's what quantum is trying to figure out, the invisible part. The visible part we're done with. We did that all the way up to the classical mechanics up to the end of the 19th century. We figured out the visible stuff. It's the invisible part that they haven't figured out. And so they have, since they're insisting on particles, they have to invent all these magical, mystical mechanisms in order to get it done. And they say, well, we don't understand it, but that's how Mother Nature works. No, that's the way Mother Nature works if you try to simulate her workings with particles. That's the problem. Okay, so maybe it's time to, like I said last time, to make a new assumption, get rid of the particle hypothesis, you know, apply Karl Popper, Popperian falsifiability. If it don't work, get rid of it. <laughs> okay, and uh, particles don't work. That's the problem. Okay, we got to get rid of this ether once and for all. Anyone still dealing with ether has a mental problem after, you know, after the Greeks invented the ether. Here we are 2,500 years later or whatever. And they still haven't figured out, you know, that there is no ether out there. Bunch of particles. And, of course, they try to redefine it, especially the dissidents who want to insist on the ether. They say, no, there is an ether, but you just don't know what it is. And they never tell you what it, what it is. They just tell you, it ain't what you said. <laughs> it's not a bunch of particles. It's something else. Okay, what is it? Please tell me. Please enlighten me. Yeah, no one can uh, define the ether other than Bill Gady. Bunch of particles. That's it. That's what the ether has is and what it has always been. Anyone who goes outside of that doesn't know what the ether is. They keep bringing this nonsense ether in there as a as a background. Space is made of ether, bunch of particles, or space is the ether, or space contains the ether, you know, and so on. They have to have this background, the, the, this uh, these pixels on the screen that you know move behind behind all objects and and that cause pressures and so on okay and so the question is uh does technology prove theories okay and um so these are the questions uh, i'm going to address okay science equal technology does gps prove that gpr that gr the general relativity is correct does uh do computers prove that quantum mechanics is right uh, does the fact that you can predict that you can lift pins with a magnet, which we did the other day with a car and we lifted it with a magnet, right, mean that you understand the invisible mechanisms? Uh, if the explanation uh, the mathematician gives is irrational, does the computer stop working? <laughs> I mean, the computer works and he gives you an irrational explanation. Are they related? Okay. And were computers invented and developed because of quantum mechanics? Let's look at that question that last one especially right were computers invented because of quantum mechanics that's constantly thrown around people just take it for granted and they just repeat what the Nobel Prize told them right and so uh, let's start with computers here this is the history of computers you know we we started out even 2500 years ago the Sumerians um, they already had the abacus that was a computer it was a, a way of calculating you know uh, doing math uh, with with this device, okay. From there, uh, may, there, there were other hints, especially uh, like the astrolabe, uh, which was to calculate uh, positions of the stars and so on. They could calculate all that. I didn't put that in there, but we go all the way to 1804, Jacques Jacquard uh, loom with punch cards. 
all those were punch cards they would feed into the machine and it would make designs. So that was like the first computer where you put a, a card in there and it, it would go through the holes and those holes would be transmitted to the loom. The loom would make certain patterns on the cloth. So that was neat. And that was a computer. In fact, a computer applied to technology. Okay. Uh, and uh, all these, as you can see, uh, came before quantum. <laughs> okay, Hollerith card, 1895, he used a tabulating machines. They used it in 1890, I think it was, uh, to do the census. Uh, the Babbage analytical engine from 1837, also based on the Jacquard loom. Okay, uh, and then you have one which is 1941, the first programmable automatic digital computer. And even though it's uh, 1941 after um, after quantum was developed in the 1920s, it had nothing to do with quantum. It was run with tubes. And here you see something similar. Uh, that was German. And here's the uh, British one. Uh, the American, they had the ENIAC. Okay. And here's the Manchester Baby from 1948. It was run with tubes, as you can see on the right there, the vacuum tubes. Does this sound like quantum mechanics, any of this? And that was a computer. It was the first computer that stored a program, okay? It was able to uh, store memory, in other words, okay? So uh, we had computers uh, before quantum, and even after quantum, uh, we had computers that had nothing to do with quantum. So the first uh, notion, this notion that we have computers thanks to quantum is nonsense. It's ignorance, that's what it is. Okay, take it from me. <laughs> it's just ignorance. Jimmy's uh, just repeating what he heard in college. He probably never saw a, com a computer, you know, in his life uh, that de depended on quantum. Okay, he cannot justify that statement. Okay, uh, but he makes another statement regarding the fact that computers rely on transistors, which rely on semiconductors, right? And so obviously, you know, uh, uh, you can't run a computer without semiconductors without chips without silicon right it says my expertise has been studying the nucleus of the atom great we've got we've got an expert finally you know that's the playground of quantum mechanics okay so he says he's an expert in quantum mechanics and uh in uh, the nucleus of the atom that's what he studied that's what he specialized in okay so we got the expert here okay he says we wouldn't understand how semiconductors work without an understanding of the rules of quantum mechanics now that's down my path. You know, I worked with semiconductors many years, okay? So let's see if that's true, <laughs> okay? Indeed, chemistry itself, how the electrons arrange themselves around atoms ultimately can only be explained using quantum mechanics. Is that so? Well, let's find out, okay? Let's find out if this is true. Computers, they were not developed uh, uh, because of quantum mechanics at all. And now let's find out if the chip, the transistor, you know, that semi, all those semiconductors, do they have anything to do with quantum mechanics? Okay, because these guys want to take it down the line and say, look, you know, we wouldn't have all this technology if it weren't for quantum. And so they go to the chip, they go to the semiconductor, say, hey, you know that, the only way we develop that is because of quantum. No, we did not, not at all. Okay, so let's make sure we, we bury that notion. Okay, here's the, the first notion, okay? We have Mr. Mendeleev, and um, he created the, um, was the guy who first came up with the table of the elements. 1869, his first attempt, he had other attempts later on where he modified, perfected his table of the elements, and that's all you need to do semiconductors. All you need is that table. You need to understand that table, even under the uh, notion of the, um, electron B going around the atom, which they didn't have at the time, okay? They still had an idea that all these elements had different properties depending on where they were on the table. And for that, you know, all they needed to do, like if, if you want to do um, semiconductors, all you need to understand is the difference between boron, silicon, and phosphorus as a basis. You know, there's other gallium arsenide and so on, but if you know a little bit about boron, a little bit about phosphorus, and about silicon, you're done. That's that's 90% of the semiconductors out there or more, you know. And here it is, okay. Here's a chip, okay. This is what it looks like in chemical terms. You have silicon all around. You have a boron 
uh, atom that is what is known as implanted in the midst of silicon atoms, okay? So the silicon atoms form a lattice and you're gonna introduce a boron in there. You're gonna insert boron in there. What is boron? Boron only has three electrons. We're gonna use the quantum nomenclature here just, just to get our point across, not important, but uh, you introduce boron, it's got three electrons in its outer shell. So, it, so it's lacking one uh, electron and they call that a hole. So, so boron introduces a hole into the silicon structure. Now, silicon has four in its outer shell, so it's always, you know, silicon with silicon, they match. They have no problem. But when you introduce a hole in there, now the electrons uh, are allowed to flow as soon as you apply electricity. That's the foundation of a transistor, okay? And on the right, you see phosphorus. Phosphorus has five electrons in its outer shell, so it's got a donor. It, it donates one electron to, to, the, um, to the flow of current. Okay, so that's how they do it. Boron introduces holes, phosphorus introduces um, ne a, a, an electron. And so the question is, what does all this have to do with quantum mechanics? The question is, you know, our, uh, it, it, we could have done this by just knowing the properties of phosphorus and boron. Okay, that's the point that I'm trying to make here. And uh, if we go further, we find out that like, you know, you deal with carriers, what are known as carriers in, in the semiconductor industry. And uh, we could figure those out with 19th century so-called classical mechanics. You know, we got that, I'm not gonna read all this, but we got that, like, if, if you wanna know how many uh, atoms are in a cubic centimeter of crystalline silicon, well, you got five times 10 to the 22. How did we figure that out? Did we figure that out through quantum? No. There you see it, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. That's one of the ways they figure these things out. Where did they get that? They get that from Avogadro's number, six times 10 to the 23rd uh, moles, uh, atoms or molecules, whichever one you want uh, per mole. So these numbers are calculated. This is all 19th century stuff before quantum ever came around, okay? So we know all these stuff, how many atoms are in there, uh, we know them through, through um, or have an understanding of them through what? Through 19th century uh, technology, advancement, uh, whatever the uh, explanations, theories. We did not need quantum. All this preceded quantum. And we can create a semiconductor today with this, with this information. We did not need quantum. In fact, nobody applied quantum to develop the chip. So this is the, the notion uh, uh that i'm that these people are trying to say they're trying to tell you that we wouldn't have had semiconductors or know for example how many carriers you have in the silicon unless we went in there with quantum this is nonsense this is not true this is absolutely not true the mole already came from uh from the 19th century uh avogadro he lived in the 18th to the 19th century you know he split those two centuries he came up with uh his law okay uh, of gases. So we understood already a lot of stuff in the 19th century, even without knowing what an atom looked like. We just knew it through the properties. How do you know the properties? You go to the lab, you run an experiment, you say, oh, this one has different property than this other one. That's it. And, uh, and so you don't need any more of that to develop semiconductors. So this notion that semiconductors were developed because of quantum mechanics and that uh, semiconductors and transistors and uh, chips, etc., cetera, uh, owe their life to quantum mechanics. That's a myth, a total myth, it has no place in science. These people are simply repeating what they, uh, what they were fed in college without ever questioning that or even doing the research on whether that's true or not. Okay, so what does uh, Al-Khalili try to do? Once he's uh, finished uh, giving you an introduction on quantum and the great greatness of quantum and how it uh, governs our technological world. He tries to apply this. He tries to uh, introduce this into biology. Okay. And so a good place to start is finding out, you know, what is this thing called biology? Okay. Let's find out. There it is. You look it up and say, well, biology is the natural science that studies life and living organisms. Okay. What does it study? Well, it turns out that they have no idea what life is. They never defined the word life or living entity or alive. They have no idea what that means. There's currently no consensus regarding the definition of life. 
Okay. In the past, there have been many attempts to define what is meant by life through obsolete concepts that have now been disproved by biological discoveries. Okay. Uh, since there is no unequivocal definition of life, most current definitions in biology are descriptive. So we have no definition of life. And there's an example whether or not viruses should be considered as alive is controversial. So there's a whole bunch of biologists out there that still don't understand the difference between a living entity and a, an inert one. And they wonder whether a virus is alive or not. Tomorrow they're going to try to interview a virus because they think it's alive. I mean, again, it shows you the state of, uh, of learning in colleges. If they still don't have a definition of life, of what a, a living entity is, and these people consider themselves biologists, you know, if you're going to do biology, and biology is the study of life, the first word you need to define is life. Otherwise, you're not a biologist. You haven't graduated out of uh, kindergarten biology. You can't move on because other than that, all you can do is just go to the lab, do experiments and say, oh, yeah, we noticed this thing and this other thing. Yeah, you can do all that, but you, you still don't have an explanation. You don't have an understanding because you don't even know what life is. So you don't know, you don't understand <laughs> what a living entity is. You can't define what a living entity is, okay? So the first thing we do in science is, again, we define words. We have to know what, what we're studying. Alive, a natural object that moves against the path of least resistance. Essentially, a living entity has the ability to move against gravity. That's it, okay? Rocks can't do that. And life then is a group of living beings, okay? So any group that's contextual, you can say that uh, life in the universe, and that means all the objects, all the set of all uh, entities that are alive in the universe, or you can talk about the living entities that you, uh, that belong to a given system. So that's contextual, but there you have the definition. Life is a group of living beings. What's a living entity? One that can move against gravity, essentially, okay? Uh, it can also move sideways against uh, the wind and so on. And so that's why path of least resistance is a better definition, probably. Now that we have a definition, we, we can use that consistently in our discussion. Okay? We can't just go in there and say, oh, we don't know what life is, but I'm a biologist. <laughs> I study life. <laughs> well, keep studying. Someday you'll figure out a definition. Okay. Okay. Uh, what does Al Khalili do once he gets his uh, quantum into biology, which he still hasn't defined? Okay, he doesn't know what a living entity is, but he's going to talk about life and how quantum has to do with that. He says, just as quantum particle can be at two places at once, the lump of energy, the lump of sunlight, the photon, follow multiple routes simultaneously inside the cell. You see what they're doing here? They're introducing quantum into biological processes. Okay. That's the only way we can explain the efficiency of photosynthesis. So there's quantum mechanics going on there. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, so this guy is saying, look, we can't explain what's going on inside a, a little leaf there with, with the photosynthesis. So we're going to introduce quantum and just apply all those things we learned in quantum mechanics. We're going to apply it to biology. Okay, that's what he's saying here. Uh, enzymes seem to be able to transfer particles from one place to another instantaneously in what's called quantum tunneling. Well, maybe they do it through the rope. You never think thought of that, uh, changing the assumptions and saying, well, it's not all uh, mediated by particles. Maybe, maybe light is a rope and maybe it has a way, one atom here to affect an atom over there through the electromagnetic rope. Maybe there's a physical entity there that we can't see or touch called a rope, an electromagnetic rope, that is transferring these motions, these vibrations from one atom to another. So, so this is the issue. And by the way, they can't touch the particles either. So don't bring touch and see into the into the picture because you know the quantum particle they can't see or touch them either. Okay, so don't don't say why can't I touch the rope? Well, why can't you touch the particle? We're in the same boat. Okay. Um, anyways, without that quantum tunneling, enzymes wouldn't be able to do the job they do, which is to catalyze and speed up all the chemical reactions that are going inside living cells. So you can see how they're uh, force-feeding quantum into 
biology. Whether you like it or not, they're going to introduce this because they get, have to create jobs essentially for a lot of uh, biologists. And they say now they're at the level where they can go into the atomic world and find out how these processes work. Very simple. We'll just introduce quantum in that same space and create a, uh, you know, job security, a cottage industry for a whole bunch of biologists who want to get deeper into an understanding of the process, biological processes. Okay, and uh, he doesn't stop there. Th this one just blew me away. Consciousness, you know, there are people out there who always talk about consciousness, conscious. Uh, Hare Krishna, as I call them, anyone introducing the word consciousness into the discussion, Hare Krishna. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Okay, and here, this is what he says. And again, this comes back to good old um, quantum mechanics. He says, quantum mechanics explains consciousness. Aha. Uh -huh. Consciousness is mysterious and we don't understand it. Quantum mechanics is mysterious and we don't understand it. Therefore, the two must be connected in some way. <laughs> I like his logic. His logic is we don't understand consciousness. We don't understand quantum mechanics. So, the, uh, so maybe consciousness is, uh, you know, mediated by uh, quantum processes. Okay. So I like uh, that's my golden rule. Okay. I'm going to apply it to quantum. The golden rule of mathematical physics: if you don't understand it, it must be quantum. <laughs> Good old Al Khalili. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, uh, he continues with this. He's going to introduce some of the quantum processes here. He's going to uh, briefly describe or apply them to biology. Here's the first one. He says, quantum biology requires quantum coherence. Because it's quantum biology, it better de require coherence. A particle behaving like a wave rather than as a pinpoint particle. So it's both a wave and a particle. And the po particle always has these magical properties, okay? An electron or proton, you can't say it's a little ball over there orbiting the atom like a miniature solar system. It's a suddenly spread out cloud of probability. That's what an electron is, a cloud of probability, a mathematical entity, mathematical object. <laughs> what is that? What is a cloud of probability? They had to invent this idiotic way of speaking. First, uh, to talk in parables to the public so they wouldn't understand. And then they, they mean, well, you know, we know what we mean by that. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, you got to take math to understand what we just said. So that way they keep the rabble out. They say, look, if you didn't understand math, you're not going to understand. See, we, we use these terms that we had to introduce in order to make sense of this. But if you want to understand them, you got to take 10 years of college. And again, he cannot present that to the general public and say, look, let me try to explain to you what that means. No, he can't because he says, we don't understand it either. So if he doesn't understand it, what is he talking about? <laughs> okay, cloud of probability. What the hell is that? Quantum co coherence is an effect that we in the physics lab see all the time, but we don't expect to see it inside li living cells. Like saying, we didn't expect to see it, but now with quantum biology, we're going to see it every day. So get ready for uh, until the world ends, right? You're going to hear a lot about quantum biology. Okay, They're just going to introduce quantum processes like decoherence and uh, superposition into uh biology. They're going to try to explain biological processes, consciousness, including consciousness, all in terms of quantum mechanics. Okay, And a lot of people have already tried that. Um, Roger Penrose is one who's uh, heavy on that, because once they finish with all this physics stuff, they move on. Where do they move on? To the, to the human being, especially his thinking, the soul. You know, they talk about consciousness. And if they're going to talk about their physicists, mathematical physicists, what they're going to have to introduce is quantum mechanics in that space. They're going to say, ah, oh, I can explain it with quantum mechanics. Oh, you can? How? Well, see, we have all these magical processes like superposition and tunneling, and we're just going to introduce those into consciousness, and we can explain consciousness with all this nonsense that we don't understand in quantum mechanics. That's what's going to happen here. Okay, That's where they're headed. And one of the reasons for that, again, is to, in, to create a cottage industry of quantum mechanics in each one of these fields, biology, psychology, psychiatry, who knows, you know, all that's got a uh, quantum background now, a quantum um, underpinning, okay? 
So he continues here and he says, uh, how do they enzymes maintain themselves in the busy, noisy, warm, complex environment of a living cell with thousands of chemical reactions going on, lots of particles bumping into each other? And so here are the processes that he proposes to introduce into quantum biology. Okay, this is going to explain not only biological processes, but consciousness, you know, why you think the way you think. They're going to explain everything with this, okay? Quantum coherence, the wave suddenly collapses down to a particle. Quantum superposition, the idea that two waves can interact and interfere with each other. Quantum entanglement, that's the idea that we have two separated particles in space that can instantaneously communicate with each other. How's that for magic? And quantum tunneling, I like this one. The particle moves through a force field through an energy barrier, the equivalence of a phantom gliding through a solid wall. <laughs> now, how's that for magic, okay? Yeah, that is magic. And these are the explanations these guys are giving you. So uh, are we supposed to take quantum as an explanation? And even assuming we do, are we going to extrapolate that and introduce it into biology and say, now we can explain biology as well with all this nonsense, with all these uh, incomprehensible processes that they have in quantum mechanics, so-called mathematical physics that has nothing to do with physics. But I like his ending. His ending, he rants against uh, this fellow, uh, Deepak Chopra, okay, famous uh, um, uh, guru to the stars in Hollywood. Okay, that's how he made his money. And Alkali says, you don't believe in magic, but in quantum world, that sort of thing happens all the time. Yeah, he said it there. I mean, I didn't say it. Those are his words, okay? And he dismisses Deepak Chopra saying, uh, he, he puts words in Deepak's uh, mouth saying, he would say that those things uh, that can explain telepathy and uh, homeopathy. In other words, these are also, quantum can also explain that as well. And Alkali there is, draws a line. He says, oh, no, those are not science. But it doesn't make entanglement any less mysterious. So he dismisses what, uh, what Deepak Chopra does, which is nonsense, he dismisses that as unscientific, but he accepts his nonsense as scientific. He says, oh, my nonsense is quite scientific because see, we have decoherence and we have uh, superposition, tunneling and entanglement, which we don't understand, which is magic, but that's science. It's just this uh, telepathy and homeopathy, which is not science quite arbitrary. It looks like his opinion. That's all it is, because I don't see how he can say that the nonsense that he does is science either. Okay, so we go to the summary. What's the summary for, for good old Al Khalili? Here we have it. Al Khalili admits that he and his math magicians do not understand the mechanics part of quantum. Correct. They don't understand it. They confess it. They admit it. They don't even challenge it. Okay. We had Feynman say it, we said, before him we had uh, Bohr say it, Werner Heisenberg, they all said the same thing. We don't understand it. So don't try to tell me that you understand it, because if you say you understand it, it means you didn't. <laughs> okay? In spite of this, he claims that we wouldn't have modern technology if it weren't for quantum magic. So uh, we have a problem. On the one hand, they say they don't understand it. Then on the other, say, oh, but we wouldn't have technology if it weren't for quantum mechanics. There's a contradiction there, and you got to resolve that. Whoever uh, you fight in a forum, take this. Uh, they have a contradiction. Alkalini proposes to apply quantum incoherence, <laughs> as I call it, to biology. They have an incoherent world in quantum, but they want to extrapolate that to biology. He states that cells and subcomponents um, also work according to the mystical processes of quantum, to wit, uh, coherence, superposition, entanglement, and tunneling. They don't understand any of those processes, but he's going to apply them to biology. Food for thought. You should really look into all that. If you're into, if, especially if you go into uh, sites that throw in your face the fact that computers and semiconductors wouldn't work if it weren't for quantum, you know, ask them, well, what, which quantum theory are you talking about that we do understand? Is it the decoherence or coherence? Is it uh, superposition, tunneling, entanglement? Which one of those are you applying inside the computer? 
And see, if, if they apply it, it's like the magnet. Yeah, you can apply something because you've seen a phenomenon and you say, oh, I can pick up pins with this magnet. I think I can use that for something and make money off of that. Yeah, that's true. But that doesn't mean that you know, or you understand, you can explain how the magnet did it. You know, how did it physically pick up the pins from afar? How did it pull those pins up through the air? doesn't mean you can explain that. And the same thing with computers. The fact that you saw something in the lab and you say, oh, I can use that effect and apply it to technology and build a device and make money. Yeah, that doesn't mean you understood the mechanism going on in that invisible world, which Alkalinia is telling you we don't understand it. And theory is understanding, explanation. Theory is not a description saying, oh, yeah, we saw something we can explain, uh, we can describe it mathematically, and because we saw this effect, we can use it. None of that has anything to do with theory. Theory is an explanation, is understanding, knowing, to use that word, what goes on in that invisible world of Mother Nature's. Okay?